I just have to react to that. Uh, yes, it did bring people into the street, but then what happened? Is there any example of smart mobs turning into governing structures? What's happened now? Mm. Where are all the liberal guys with computers? Absolutely. They're not, you know, they're not running a place. So I have a, I'm skeptical. I don't mean that. I retain the, the main right to, the main right to be seen. Um, uh, I think um, I'm here primarily as the author of Close to the Machine. I think Fred uh, uh, is, knows that book, and I think that's why I'm here. Um, that book, however, was published in 1997, so a lot of things have happened since then. Um, it was a time when very few people understood what was going on inside the technical world. And when I wrote Close to the Machine and an earlier essay called Reflections on the Programming Life, I was keenly aware of, of sort of being a distant early warning system, that we programmers led a machine-mediated life, and soon we all would, and uh, whether that's good or bad, that came true. Um, and I think I have to contribute is my experience as a practitioner. I've been looking at system architectures now for about 30 years, and I hope this has given me the ability to evaluate their effects on us. Uh, when I look at a system, my primary question is this, in terms of its effects on society. What is its digital definition of a person? Does the system seem, seek to augment human abilities, serve as a helper, doing dull tasks that we could go on to better things, in this way furthering creative contributions to society? Or does the system define down what an individual is, as it were, caring less about the, uh, the depth of a single contribution than you know, favoring quantity, massive, perhaps? Um, to demonstrate what I mean by helpers, I'm going to pick an example that may seem absurdly counterintuitive, and that's the uh, mainframe systems of the 1960s and 70s. These systems are remembered as dictators, monoliths, big brother overlords, uh, under whose reign we suffered conformity, regimentation. Now, I programmed an IBM 370, and I can tell you we did a lot of really dull stuff. Uh, general ledgers, profit and loss statements, inventory reports. We programmers did the grunt work of the backroom business minutia, and the people running the uh, enterprise were free to go around and think of bigger and better thoughts. Um, the side effects of these systems were orderliness, regimentation, conformity to the way the machine did things, and these effects were rightly feared. But and this is uh, not entirely a deserved rap. I'd like to point out that the tasks the machines were regimenting were ones that were already stiffly structured. Uh, double entry accounting, sales tax computations, rule-based, bounded activities, uh, perfect jobs for a machine. Uh, I'd like to compare these to the systems we live in uh, today, uh, which attempts to organize the parts of human life that are wonderfully imprecise <coughs> and simple. Um, how we describe ourselves to the world, how we like to be known, how we make connections to people, how we live within society. These are activities I propose are not fit for a machine. Uh, to give us some idea of uh, how we got here, I'd like to discuss the paradigms and philosophies that underlie what I think of as the two incarnations of the web. The first is from the mid-1990s to the uh, bursting of the bubble in 2000. And the second is the rising of the web out of all that wreckage up to where we are now. Uh, I can only give like a 40,000 foot view here um, you know, two deep philosophies in ten minutes, but here we go. Now, um, incarnation one of the mid uh, of the web, mid 1990s. Um, data servers are massively connected. Storage capacities are infinite in scope. Uh, this is before everyone had iPhones, and information is searchable at a previously a previously unimaginable speed. I want to take a step back and give a glimpse of what led to the development of powerful search engines. Uh, in 1986, I worked as a software engineer at Sidebase, which is a, a leader in relational database design. Representatives of the department, I once talked about this with Larry Page, whom I'm sure you all know as the uh, co-founder of Google. It, it was an informal situation. We were out to dinner with his family. And I told him my concerns about this rich get richer scenario. And he was quiet for a while. Larry is nothing if not thoughtful and brilliant. And then he said, I used to worry about that but I decided there was nothing I could do. And what he meant was there was nothing he could do algorithmically 
if you brought in editors, specialists, <coughs> expert evaluators, the web search would turn into something hidebound, you know, some Encyclopedia Britannica, where instead of nanosecond searches, uh, answers would flow like cold molasses. There was no place for curators in the system. The algorithm is all. Um, we don't have time to go through the next things I was going to say, so I'll skip to after the bursting of the text bubble. Text bubble in 2000, talent scatters and then regroups, uh, startups die, new ones come to life, we come to web incarnation too. So 20 years after the Depart Department of Defense wanted the ability to analyze masses of data, we just can't help ourselves from throwing in everything about ourselves so everyone will know it. Um, social media, of course, um, and here we have, uh, as you discussed, incorporated technology, literally in taken it into our bodies as we go about the most fundamental human activities, social life. And what I want to talk about here is that um, even going back to uh, commerce on the web, that is a very deep and ancient human activity, exchange. Uh, was something we finessed since the times we lived in tribes. And here with um, society is another deep evolutionary trait. It, it's the ability to read uh, subtle clues, to know at a glance if someone is friend or foe. These were essential to our survival as a species. Um, we're physically puny creatures in the great scheme of things. It's social cooperation that sustained us. Um, so now these subtle interactions, uh, marvelously varied, complicated, intricate, tangled, are being organized into a fixed set of entries on a Facebook form. Now Facebook now dominates the internet. Google is a force, but it's playing catch-up. It's fallen behind the game. The power of a search engine has been curtailed. Search engines cannot see inside Facebook, and Facebook is going to keep it that way. The internet now resembles a field of warring, medieval lords. Drawbridges are up, moats are stocked with legal alligators. Each prince is trying to expand his domain by capturing the subjects of lesser nobles. Google buys YouTube, Facebook buys Instagram. You can make a long list of these things. I think the important thing to notice as our activities in these fortresses is that individual contributions have become smaller and smaller over time. Um, the good old days, what looks like the good old days of the web, the cool thing was to make your own website. It was creative. Uh, every site looked different. It was getting away from the conformity of Windows on Mac and uh, Microsoft Windows. And now publicists have advised me, don't waste any energy on a website. You better go ramp up those likes on Facebook. Um, an analysis by the New York Times found that users were moving away from blogs in favor of tweets. I would add, of course, young people have been marching at mass exodus away from email to texting, from quirky personal websites to blogs to email to text to tweets to the pre-formatted entries on Facebook and ever-shrinking means of expression. I'm going to add that we programmers are, are part of this reduction in individual contribution. Um, of course, there are computer scientists who are very valued inside companies like Google and fast, fast uh, traders on market, um, those companies that do fast trading. But there are a very small percentage of practitioners. The rest of us are like co either corporate coders, uh, uh, who in the words of a friend of mine who is a technical managing director are considered to be fungible. One is good as the next, moved around from project to project in what she feels is chaotic ways without the idea that this will affect the overall effort. And then there's where everyone wants to be, writing apps. We once wrote applications, which required planning and cooperation between programmers on a large scale, which believe me, cooperation among programmers is a very difficult thing to do. But now, in the words of the venture capitalist, investors are looking for something that two guys can write for the weekend. I better run through this now. Have I got 10 left? I have six. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> What's underlying this is, is a, this a diminution of individual contributions is a philosophy called chaos theory. Uh, it, it recently has acquired um, uh, more popular names like flash marks, 
mobs, smart mobs, hive mind, the wisdom of the crowds, they all have the same idea. What we call uh, intelligence uh, arises out of a great number of players. The more players, the more the organization is uh, complex. The iconic example is the ant colony. You know, stupid creatures, they have these tiny, they web antennae, rub antennae, and exchange a couple of pheromones. And, uh, but out of this comes the complexity of, of the ant colony. No one designed it, it emerges. Uh, Larry Page has said that at some point, given a massive contribution, a number of contributions, the internet will become alive. As Jaron Lanier wrote in his book, We Are Not a Gadget, it's a religious vision, a belief in a supreme being, a force above and beyond us. Ten years ago, I heard a talk in which the influential uh, technophile Kevin Kelly uh, asked the question, what does technology want? It's now the subject of his latest book. And I'll quote from his personal website. Technology as a whole is a living, evolving organism that has its own unconscious needs and tendencies, end quote. Uh, it's this disturbing idea that technology inherently predicts uh, a destiny that human beings must enact. I once compared Kevin Kelly to Paul Pot, who was my <laughs> Lanier, in his book, uh, calls Kelly's vision Maoist, uh, Taeyang serving some higher good, the hive mind, the ant colony come to human life. Uh, I think there's a lot more to evaluate about uh, technology in our lives. Uh, it's changing so quickly that um, it will, I think in 20 years, someone will look back and tell uh, me more about what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to end with something cheerful, which if everyone knows me, is not characteristic. <laughs> Now, the sphere of programming has grown enormously since I wrote Close to the Machine. A much greater portion of the population can look inside the machine and evaluate its effects. Perhaps all these new young programmers will change our direction. I don't know where they'll take us, but it does give me hope. Go better. Thanks. Thank you.